please stand in body or in spirit and join me in the call to worship from the song appointed for today, Psalm 130. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If you, O God, really held us to account, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you, so that you may be revered. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in God's word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord, more than those who watch for the morning. O you faithful, hope in the Lord, for with God there is steadfast love and great power to redeem. God will redeem the people from all their transgressions. Let us worship God together with our opening hymn, number 384 in your hymn book, O Love That Will Not Let Me Go. Uh, 
Amen. Dear friends in Christ, God's grace reaches out to us in kindness to open a new beginning for each one of us. The promise of Scripture is that mercy and love surround us always. Our Creator cherishes us, and in Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. <laughs>
Dear God, thank you for sending Jesus to show us what it means to be a friend. Help us to find ways to be Jesus' friends and followers this week by the way we treat our friends, our families, and everyone we meet. Amen. So don't forget that we are um, have coin boxes for the One Great Hour Sharing offering that comes in April. And so if you didn't get one yet, I think Mrs. O'Shea can give you one. And this is a way that we help people too, right? We put our coins in and it helps people all around the world. So you guys get to go to Sunday school with Mrs. O'Shea and we're gonna stand and sing our praise and hear you out for So the sister sent a message to Jesus, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, after having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, Let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the religious leaders were just now trying to stone you, and are you going there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours of daylight? Those who walk during the day do not stumble, because they see the light of this world. But those who walk at night stumble, because the light is not in them. After saying this, he told them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen, fallen asleep, but I am going there to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he'll be all right. Jesus, however, had been speaking about his death, but they thought that he was referring merely to sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake, I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe but let us go to him. Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away, and many of the religious leaders and the other Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. When she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, the teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. 
<coughs> All the Jewish friends who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary get up quickly and go out. They followed her because they thought she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And Jesus saw her weeping, and all the Jewish friends who came with her also weeping. He was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. <clears throat> so all the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench because he's been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth, and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. Here ends the passage. May God add blessings to our understanding of the Holy Word. Will you pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be always acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Well, during the season of Lent, we hear some of the most wonderful stories in the Bible, like Jesus' 40 days in the wilderness, his healing a man born blind, his conversations with the Samaritan woman at the well, and the religious leader Nicodemus. There's the story of how God chose David, the youngest child, to be the next king of Israel, and how God provided water to the unhappy Israelites in the desert. The promise that God made to Abraham in calling him to a new country, and the story of Adam and Eve and the serpent in the garden. These stories tell us about all kinds of people in all kinds of circumstances of life and how they experienced their relationship with God. Some of them were faithful, some fell away, some received gifts of one kind or another, but in today's stories we find God giving the most amazing gift of all. For today's stories tell us about God giving life, but not in the way that we normally think of it. Usually we think of God bringing forth life where there has not been life before, like making water come out of a rock or making humanity out of dust. But today we hear stories about God bringing life back where life has been but has run out. So in these stories we find that not only can God create God can revive. Things that are dead, things that are really dead, God can make them live again. In Ezekiel, we heard about the valley of the dry bones. The prophet Ezekiel was led out by God to a valley full of bones. There are many of them, and there are, they are very dry, we are told. And we do not know how the bones got there, whether this valley was a scene of some long ago battle where armies were lost, or whether it was a village that got wiped out by some kind of a plague. But whatever it used to be, 
it's clear that many people had died there and had died a long time ago because all Ezekiel can see are bones and many dry bones at that. So after showing Ezekiel around, God asks, can these bones live? Now that's sort of an odd question. We know that bones cannot live again. In fact, I wonder if we think of bones as something that was alive in the first place. When I see a bone, I don't really connect it to what it used to be. It's too far removed from life. So by the time I see a bone, all the layers of what seemed to me to be lifelike, the shape of its body, its hands, its eyes, its beak, its fur, whatever covered those bones up has been gone for a long time. So when I encounter a bone, I have no idea what kind of life it once supported. And I don't really connect it with having been alive. Bones are really associated with death, right? Think about the, the flag on the pirate ship, right? It's a skull and crossbones. It's a symbol of death. Because by the time you see a bone, whatever it once was is long gone. But still God asks the prophet, can these bones live? Now Ezekiel does not give his real answer, which has to be, of course not. How could something that's been dead so long be made alive again? No, Ezekiel recognizes a rhetorical question when he hears it, because he says, only you know, O oh God. And then by the power of God, the bones come together and tissue reconnects them and muscles and organs are laid over them and skin covers them. So now Ezekiel sees bodies lying everywhere, not moving, looking as though they have simply fallen asleep. So even though they now look like they possibly can live, these bones, these bodies, these people are not yet alive. They must have looked a little bit like Lazarus lying in the tomb for four days. And just a side note, in Jesus' time, people believed that the soul stayed with the body for three days after death. So having left Lazarus in the tomb for four days, is to show that he's not just dead, he is really dead. Just like the valley of the dry bones. So now we have the bones in the valley that are lying, bodies that are intact but not quite alive. And so we also have Lazarus' body in the tomb for four days. Whole bodies, but not breathing not moving, not alive. Now usually we think of two states of living, right? You're either alive or you're dead. But these stories suggest maybe a little more of a spectrum from alive to almost alive to kind of dead and then really dead. Because the state of the bones that Ezekiel first encountered looks different than the bodies he is now looking at which are not alive, but look a lot more alive than the bones did at the beginning. He starts out seeing dry, dusty bones scattered in the dirt. Now he sees bodies lying everywhere, but no breath in them. So God commands the four winds and fills the bodies with breath, and they come alive and get up on their feet. In the same way Jesus called Lazarus forth from the tomb, his lifeless body again filled with breath, and he gets on his feet and comes out to the crowd. All these bodies, once dead, are now alive again. 
but probably still not quite living. Lazarus, will tell, we are told when he comes out, is bound with his grave cloths. His hands and feet are tied together. His face is wrapped up in a cloth. He can't live that way for very long. The bodies standing and facing Ezekiel are not quite living yet either. They are alive, but not living. And that's where both of these stories end. It's up to us to imagine what Lazarus and Ezekiel's multitudes go on to do with their new lives. Surely they go out to work and eat and play and get married and live before they die again. So it makes me think of the question, are we alive or are we living? These stories always remind me of one of my favorite movies, The Shawshank Redemption. And in that movie, the main character played by Tim Robbins has been put in jail for a crime he says he did not commit. And he's in prison for many years. He has to learn the rules of how to survive on the inside. And he is able to make some meaning out of his time because he strives to get a library built in the prison and then he begins to help other inmates study for their GED so they can have some education when they're ready to leave. And there comes a point when it seems he might have a chance to prove he's innocent, but it's a brief moment and it becomes clear that whatever the facts are, the warden wants him to stay inside as part of the system, his model prisoner. So when he realizes he no longer has any hope of being free, he tells his friend he has only two options, to get busy living or get busy dying. He knows the life that he's been living inside the prison walls has not really been living. He's alive, but he's just existing. He's just filling up the time, waiting for something to happen. And he realizes that waiting is not going to be enough. He needs to have hope in something else. In Paul's letter to the Romans, he says, To set the mind on the flesh is death, because all flesh will die. The dry bones and Lazarus' body are proof enough that flesh by itself cannot live. But Paul continues to set the mind on the spirit is life. It is when God's spirit comes into those bodies that they begin to live again. None of us can live on our own. Our life is given to us by the spirit of God. As human beings, as children of God, each of us holds within us the divine spark of vitality that holds the promise of continually reviving us and continually renewing our lives. So we can ask ourselves, are we busy living or are we busy dying? Are we lying still bound by external limitations or are we full of the breath of life standing in the service of God? What are we doing with the life God has given us? Are we living up to the hopes and dreams our parents had for us? Or the hopes and dreams we had for ourselves? Are we living up to the hopes and dreams that God has for us and has called us to? Or have we fallen into a place of simply existing, where we are marking time and acquiring stuff and hoping to hide from all the complicated realities and bad news of this world. God gives us breath, but it is up to us to live. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our hymn is
number 316 in your hymn book, Breathe on the Breath of God. We pray for all those who are ill and have no way to get to or see a doctor. 
for those who cannot afford to see a doctor, and for those who cannot afford the medicine they need. And finally, we ask God's blessings on all those who are trying to save this beautiful planet on which we live. May we all recognize that treating our earth, animals, and fish well will help all people. So let us gather up all of our prayers together. O oh God, our Creator, we are thankful for the gift of life, for gifts to share, for those who love us, and for our congregation where the gospel is proclaimed, and we hear words of hope for this life and the life to come. In the spirit of the prophet Ezekiel, we pray for the breath of God to bring new life to all who are working for peace, Remembering the grief of Mary and Martha and the tears of Jesus, we pray for all those who are grieving, for those who are ill, for those who are coming to the end of this earthly life. We recognize the reality of grief, the power of love, and the gift of resurrection to eternal life. We lift our prayers for the poor and the hungry, the homeless, the addicted, the unemployed, those who are in prison, those who are victims of war, those who are losing hope, and victims of every kind. We pray for justice and mercy as signs of God's kingdom here on earth, just as Jesus told us. And we lift our voices together to say the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let us use the words of scripture to be invited to our giving from the prophet Nehemiah. The people of Israel are to bring their contributions of grain, new wine, and oil to the storerooms where the articles for the sanctuary are kept. We will not neglect the house of our God. Giving is, is an act, act of faith. faith. Sisters and brothers in Christ, let us live as God imagines we will, giving to the needs of the world by making offerings of our life and labor. The offering plates are at the back of the aisles, or you can go to our website, newscotlandpc.org, anytime to make your gift and support our ministries. We give in praise for all of our blessings. So let us stand and with joy and thanksgiving sing the words of praise in the doxology. Thank <laughs>
brothers, we go into a world that trusts politics and propaganda, wealth and power. We go into a world that profits from injustice, that makes wars too much and peace too little. We go into a world that trusts only in itself. So let us go out into this world, and in all of our living, our hoping, and our loving, let us trust God, and let us go in God's ways. And may the blessing of God go with you and all those whom you love, both this day and always. Amen.